of the battle that we're in spiritually, right? Because God proves himself faithful over and over and over again. We may take our bruises, but God has the victory. And so we are, we're in a miracle right here. God has provided for us, and it's exciting to come into the house of the Lord to worship him. And we still have drive-in church, so people are sitting out in the sunshine, looking in. It's awesome to see this and, and see what God's doing. And so uh, buckle up. We're on for our amazing ride, and uh, it's so good to see each and every one of you here. Uh, it, it's hard to believe. We got Thanksgiving this Thursday, right? And so much to be thankful for, right? Uh, we're thankful for no matter what our country goes through, we have a true God that's sovereign, in control, and he has a plan for our lives. And so uh, we are blessed here as the church to have a great leader in bread. It helps keep our focus not on the storm that's around us, but keep our focus on Jesus Christ who is the answer to every storm that we go through. So I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful for each and every one of you here. Uh, so I just pray we all have a great week, a week of great celebration and Thanksgiving, and, um, and we're just uh, we're so blessed, and uh, I'm so glad to be a part of this. Christmas is just around the corner, right? So Christmas is not too far away, and one heartbeat that we have as a church is to go find families uh, to help support them. So we have partnered with uh, the Lighthouse in downtown Lynchburg, uh, we usually couple up with them and get uh, four families that we can uh, take care of, you know, mom, dad, children, um, so to buy gifts and take care of them so they have everything they need from food to presents. So this year we'll do that again. Brian and Michelle will give us more details later, but we will partner with Lighthouse downtown to support four families completely, take care of the whole family present-wise and food-wise and, and do that. We're also partnering with uh, Brittany's uh, realty company, um, Divine Fog, and uh, Toys for Tots. So Toys for Tots to bring brand new unwrapped toys, bring toys in here, and we'll get that to the Toys for Tots. If you want to make a donation, we recommend you write a check out to Impact Church, and on the memo line, just put Toys for Tots, and then we'll make sure we get that to Toys for Tots. And uh, but. We as a church are so blessed that we need to look after our community and be a, a hands and feet and go out and support our community any way we can. Um, if you have somebody, you see a family that's struggling, in need, um, they're going through the holidays and need help, please let us know about that so we can, uh, we can step up as a church and do what we are supposed to be, what we're called to do, and that is to support our community and those that are in need. So uh, it's just awesome to be in the house of the Lord. Let's go into prayer uh, and let's just, just start worshiping. Dear God, we thank you so much for being such a faithful, faithful God to us. We stand in this building, and we give you all the glory for it. God, I just, and what we have been through as a church, the spiritual battle, Father, there are moments that it's just like, whew, I, I mean, out of breath, exhausted, and the battle is hard, but then there's days like today. When we press on, we press on, we press on, and we get to a mountaintop, and we see your hand has been with us the whole time. We see your faithfulness. We see your provision in this, uh, in this moment where we have this building that we can worship in. Father, our encouragement is that everyone in this building that can hear my voice, if you're in that battle and you're fighting that fight and you're pressing on, keep pressing on. Keep pressing on. God is with you. God is carrying you through the dark valley. God is going to lift you up, as God is going to take care of you. And Father, the fight is real and the spiritual battle is real, but God, you are in control. And Father, we are we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. The storm may go on around us, but Father, we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. And we know that in any moment, Jesus Christ can say, peace, be still, and the storm can be calmed. God, we give you all the glory for what you're doing in our lives, in our church, and through our pastor. God, we are so thankful for you, God. We're thankful for Jesus Christ, who while we were still sinners, stuck in our sin, helpless, hopeless, nothing that we could do, while we were sinners, Jesus Christ came to this earth and died for us, shed his blood, paid for our sin debt. We are so thankful for Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for loving us and demonstrating that love to us. We give you all the glory for it. Father, we thank you that the, you have given us not only victory over sin 
over the power of sin, the presence of sin. But, Father, we can walk in newness of life hand in hand with you. We can have victory day in and day out through your power. God, help us to listen to our pastor today, to listen to his words, to obey, to follow after your voice, and to be in hand in hand with you, God. And we thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Impact Church. I am so glad to be in a warm, covered building this morning. It is amazing what God can do. I want you guys to stand with us and worship with us. But um, there was one thing that the Lord gave me this week, because I'm going to tell you, it was um, it was chaotic. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, everything that happened this week, it seemed like just chaos was trying to enter in every direction, you know, whether it's come to, um, in my own personal life, when it came to picking music and everything for this week, um, it just seemed out of place and it seemed chaotic. And in the world that we're actually living in today is actually in my 30 years of existence has been the most chaotic and hectic that I have ever seen it. And so I know a lot of you, you feel like, man, everything just feels out of place. My life is in total chaos. Nothing seems to be working. And God spoke to me this week, and he said, because it's out of order. He's, that is the word that he wants you to know today, that, that it is out of order. And what that means is seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and everything will be taken care of. It will be added unto you. But you've got to be willing to put him first. And when your priority is our Heavenly Father, when your priority is putting God first, then everything else falls right into place. I want you guys to sing with us this morning. I want you to stand. I want you to lift your hands. And I want you to put him first today.
hearts because the real thing is here. He's here right now. He is our priority. He's the only thing that matters. And he's the only thing that will ever satisfy. Through whatever you're going through, whatever circumstance that you're facing right here, any of the chaos, he's the only thing that will satisfy what is going on in your life. So I just want you to worship him with all your heart this morning. I want you to cry out to him that he's the only thing that satisfies. Thank you for who you are, God. Sometimes, God, you tell us to be silent, and silence can be a good thing. But sometimes, Satan can use that silence. When we hide in that silence, Satan can use it. God tells us to go out to praise, to worship, to lift our voices up, because when we don't do that, we're allowing Satan to win. We're allowing Satan to get that foothold. You know what? Guess what? There was a place called Jericho. You know how they defeated it? They defeated it with praise. They shouted out to God. You know Jehoshaphat? They went into battle with praise and worship, and they won. They won with praise and worship. So the battle starts here. The battle starts now. It's not tomorrow. It's not next week. It's right now. That's when the battle starts. When we, we, oh, God, we just praise you. We thank you. God, we want the real thing from you, God. God, right now, lift him up. Lift him up. Give God all your praise because when you start at praise and worship, when you get down on your knees, when you lift your voices up, God hears that. And he's already won the battle. You know, he told Jehoshaphat that, that. He said, guys, the battle is mine. The victory is mine. So don't take it into your hands. When you don't know what to do, when you don't know what to say, and right now, that's a lot of us. Lift your voices up. Just praise his name. Just shout out his name. Shout out his praise. God, we thank you. We thank you, God, for all that you do. We thank you for already having the victory, God. And Lord, I pray right now that you just touch each one of our hearts with your word. That you speak through Brad into us. God, we thank you. God, we praise your name. 
In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, everybody. Can we keep giving Jesus a big round of applause? Come on. Am I on? Can y'all hear me good? Everybody hear me good out there? Good stuff. Hey, guys. Hey, God's doing an amazing work, and we get to be a part of it. And I don't know about you, but that just pumps me slam up to see what God continues to do. I mean, just to to know the, the battle and the attacks that Satan has used to come against this church. I mean, just even in the past week, we're, we're in a week 11 of a spiritual warfare series out of a 14-week series. And how many attacks have we seen the enemy try to bring against us? I mean, personally, as a church, and I'm sure in your own lives, if we could get up here and give testimony of the attacks that the enemy is, is doing in our mind, our hearts, our families, whatever the case may be, and just to see God prevail every time. Can you imagine how defeated the enemy must feel? I mean, seriously, give praise to God. I mean, just... And that's nothing to do about with us or, or us individually or with me or even us as a church. That has everything to do with Christ. That has everything to do with the shield that we're going to talk about today that God has placed us under. His protection, His provision as we stand on His Word and we give Him glory for everything He does. I just can't imagine what the enemy's looking at. It's like, man, I brought the canopy down on the dude's head out in the field. I just... We, I just asked the Lord to send winds and tear their tent up, and look what he does. He, he builds it bigger and stronger and better. Yeah, that's the guy we serve. Amen? So, hey, if you're visiting Impact today, welcome. If it's your first time, second, third time, we're so glad you're here. You get a chance to worship with us and be a part of, uh, of what God is doing. And I hope if you're searching for a church home, maybe a, a place to belong, a place that you can call home, where you can be a part of a, a body, a group of believers in fellowship, I hope and pray the Lord leads you right here to use your gifts, your talents, your abilities to serve the body of Christ, to serve our community as we go out and do God's work. We would love for you to join us and be a part of what God's doing. So um, if, if you're here and you feel like it's time to join the church, man, would you let somebody know at the end of church today, at the invitation or whatever? We'd love to connect with you, uh, share with you how you could get involved in various ways in serving and life groups and everything that goes on in Impact. So welcome here this Sunday. And if you were here um, a, a Sunday ago, we, we prayed for this, uh, this brother that um, had done Feats of Strength up here with us during our Trunk or Treat event, and he was going through some pretty significant health issues at the time. And God brought him out of it, and that brother is in church today, man. He's sitting right over there. Man, can we give praise to God for bringing our brother Marco in here today? And I tell you, man, Marco, you could have just stayed home and watched online, dog, you know? But you in here. That's right. Hey, man. Man, when God's got a hold of somebody's life, you just can't keep them out of church. You know what I'm saying? You can't. You just can't. They got breath in their lungs. They hear, man. Praise God. So, guys, we're continuing in our spiritual warfare series, as I just alluded to here. Week 11. We've been in this for some time. And we have still three more weeks after this that we will be in this series. But today we're bringing up a very special piece of armor because here recently we've come to this point in our Ephesians 6 passage where it's talking about putting on this armor so that we can engage an enemy that longs to attack us. And more than attack, he wants to destroy us, to devour, to steal, to kill, destroy, devour. All those adjectives that, that the Bible tells us our enemy is trying to do in our life. And you know, yesterday a, a close friend of mine, Todd Trial, sent me a, a text message of a picture, man, and said, he said I, I saw this, and man, I immediately thought about you and everything. God, um, you know, speaking through you and preaching here recently. And it was a picture of, on one side, a, a big, strong, male roaring lion, sitting up, up on top of a rock, just roaring. And it said, Biblical Christianity, as the tag on that. And then beside it was a picture of the lion from the cowardly lion from the Wizard of Oz, and it said, modern Christianity. Oh, 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 boy, is that not what we've been talking about, what the Lord's been bringing, and how true it is. You see, we talked about in this breastplate of righteousness how through Christ and through His righteousness that the righteous will be bold as a lion. Guys, that's, that's what God created you and I to be. It's more than conquerors so that we can be bold 
for the truth of God in a world that wants to go a different direction. But now we've got this, this 21st century American body of believers that, that are like a cowardly lion. And if you look back at that 1939 classic, The Wizard of Oz, and you see that there was these three characters, right, going with Dorothy, and, and they have to, to go to the, to the wizard because they all need something. And in my opinion, they all need something that the world really needs today. You see, because you remember the tin man needed a heart, right? And oh, how many people need a change in a new heart, a heart for Christ, a heart for God, a, a heart for truth and righteousness. The scarecrow, what did he need? He needed a brain. <laughs> Boy, there's a whole lot of people in the world that need a new brain. You know what I'm saying? Man, said, people ain't thinking straight these days. I mean, I'm just, I'm just like, where did you get? Don't you? They don't see. They're blinded. And, and we see biblically that that is a sign of the end times that people will be blinded to the truth and, and they just can't see it. You can't even speak sense into them. But here's this cowardly lion. And you remember when he shows up on the scene and he's kind of acting brave and chasing Dorothy around and, and then he goes after the little dog and Dorothy turns around and pops him on the nose. Y'all remember that? And he's like, why did you do that? Is my nose bleeding? And, and he began to show that to this exterior he wanted to seem like he was brave, but inside he was a coward. That when the attack came, that when somebody put resistance up, he buckled. Hey, guys, that's what too many of us are doing with our, our faith today. That we come to church, and as long as everything's good and, 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 and just comfortable, we're, we, we seem strong spiritually. But the minute we step out into the world and there's resistance, and we find that there's opposition to the truth of the Word of God and opposition to Jesus specifically, that we tower down. And we buckle. Hey, God, today, we want to be rejuvenated with courage today through faith in God. And that's our message today is taking up this shield of faith. And if you want to call it a, a shield of courage and think of it that way, it would be a good way to think about it because we're going to see that it takes courage to have the kind of faith that God commands us to take up in this passage. Real courage. And this courage comes from Christ, not in us. Not from a, a bowed up spirit or, or in the flesh and, and brrr, get, getting real tough and mean. That's not what it is. It's actually through humility in Christ and, and feeling like we've talked about before that I'm so weak, Lord, I don't have any fight in me. And that's a great place to be. Because the fight in your strength is only going to come from Christ. Hey, so let's look as we go through this series at this special time where we're talking about taking up a shield of faith. Because we see starting in chapter 4, in verse 1 again, that there was this concept of walking in a manner worthy of our calling. And what does that mean? And we've talked about that a little bit, about this process of sanctification that the Lord wants to bring in our lives and unity and, and walking in uniqueness, meaning to be set apart. And that's all done through the power of the Spirit of God being manifested in our life as we walk in obedience to God's Word. And we're going to see that's what grows our faith. And that's what, the, what solidifies our faith and our willingness to stand in the midst of a battle. Because as we've seen, and as we know, that there's direct resistance to this walk. This walk that you and I are called to do in a world going a different direction, is going to bring us direct opposition by itself. And it's fueled, not by flesh and blood, but by an enemy that's behind it. Y'all remember that? Hey, that's what's behind it. Yeah, there's flesh and blood that we see that seems like that's what we're against, but it's not. It's a spiritual force of evil in the heavenly realm, okay? It's a spiritual battle that's being manifested here on earth. And that's what we're fighting. So we need this shield. And we know that we have a responsibility to take this up. This is a command, guys. This isn't just a suggestion. And then, hey, well, we know because of this that we are going to be in the world. We can't just isolate ourselves and say, oh, well, this is such horrible times. I'm just going to go hide in my closet and pray. Man, please don't. Please pray. And you go in your closet and pray if you want. But please don't stay there. Get out in the world and be the light of Jesus so other people can see it. Man, that's what we need to do and, and, and bring truth with love so that other people can hear truth. And, and yes, they're going to reject you. Yes, eventually you may be persecuted for that truth. 
Man, my brother's got a word to say. Come on up here, dog. The, the spirit done moved in the little man. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, man, we know that we are going to be in the world, but just like a ship was created to be in the water, but the water is not supposed to get in the ship. Guys, and that's how we're supposed to exist in a world, that we're supposed to be salt and light, and we're going to be in the world, but we cannot let the world get in us, because just like when the water gets in the ship, it sinks. When the world gets in us, we sink. Hey, we cannot let that happen. We have to take up this shield then of protection. How do we defeat this enemy, this host of demons that are in a constant attack against us? Through what we talked about a lot already, through surrender, through commitment to Christ, by acting out in righteousness and holiness through the power of the Spirit of God. But then here's where we're moving in today. Now being bold in our faith with confidence that God's power and resource is sufficient for us in the battle. Do you, do you believe that? Do you believe that God's power and resources that he provides you is sufficient for you against an enemy that wants to attack? So now we're going to learn today, as we've come through some of these spiritual pieces of armor that we're to put on and to have on, now we're going to get to the point of some things that we're supposed to take up. In other words, we're going to see some things that now we pick up to engage the enemy. Are you ready to engage the enemy? You ever thought about that? That takes courage. That takes faith. That takes boldness. Not our boldness, but in Christ. So it's time now to fight back. Look at the person beside you and tell them it's time to fight back. Let me pray for us before we dive in. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, I'm just in awe of you, Lord, as we sit here. Lord, and I see this structure, Father, that you've provided that's stronger. It's better in every way. There's a floor where we don't have to worry about mud. There's a solid roof where we don't have to worry about rain and snow and gutters leaking. Lord, there's solid uh, aluminum and, and, and steel beams, Father, that hold 135 mile hour winds where we don't have to worry about wind. Lord, there's provision even through the trials that you allow us to walk in. Lord, can we get that message today? Lord, because I know there's somebody, they're going through a storm in their life right now. And Lord, could, could they see what you did here and know and trust? that you're going to do the same in their life? That, Lord, what the enemy is trying to tear them down with and to get discouraged them and to make them quit. That, God, if we stay strong to the end and we take up this shield of faith, Father, Lord, that you're going to build us back stronger and better than we were before. Lord, we claim your promise of your word today. We pray that you would touch every mind, every heart here. Lord, that you would move us, motivate us, Lord to a closer walk with you, that we can have the strength to stand in the shield of faith to extinguish all the arrows of the enemy. Lord, we praise you for what you're about to do through the presentation of your word. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to every single one of us as you have to me this week. And we're going to give you all the praise and glory for everything you do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, so we are in Ephesians, if you didn't know that, chapter 6. And I'm going to go ahead and read for us today, verses 10 through 17. So we kind of get this totality of the passage so far, but we're going to be specifically in verse 16 today, where it's talking about this shield of faith, as I alluded to. But let's go ahead and read the passage from Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. The Word of God says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Man, that's so huge because this is what we're coming to. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. 
There's that message again, man. I wanted us to hear that again. Stand firm then for the fourth time with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Guys, I want to show us right here off the bat in this passage where, as we look at verse 16 specifically, where it says, in addition to all this. And if you read now the King James, it says, above all. So if we notice that there's this important thought coming here. All right? It's a continuation of thought, but now there's, there's this transition a little bit, if you will. Okay? And what we see the transition of, if you look at the verb specifically to the three previous pieces of armor that we've gone through, and we alluded to this three weeks ago, is there's the word having, this verb having in there. So having this belt of truth, having this breastplate of righteousness, having your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace, Right? But now there's this transition of the verb to now, as we're going to see, it's going to be to take up. All right? So there's a difference there already. So this word having is something that we talked about. It's something that we have on us all the time. All right? So it's something that if you look at the Roman soldiers who Paul was alluding to, that there was this armor that they essentially didn't take off. Of course, they made unless they were going to sleep or taking a shower or something, which I hope they did, a bath, I guess, when the shower got in. But anyway, so there was this stuff they always had on, but then there was some stuff that they had to take up when the battle got heated, right? So if, you know, hey, so if, you know, you, you know my brain and all these kind of things around football, so if you think around football and, and you go out on, onto the field for a game, all right, and offense, defense, and let's just say you're playing offense. Well, when the defense is on the field, you don't come off on the sideline and take off your shoulder pads and, 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 t- and take all the pads out of your pants and everything and just kind of get back in your shorts and chill and watch. No, you stay ready, right? You have your shoulder pads and everything on, but then you have certain pieces of equipment which are in your hand and are always available to you that you're ready to take up, okay? So when the coach calls you to, to get on the field or when now we switch to offense, all right, and you got to go on the field, you have to have certain things ready, like your helmet. You have to have your mouthpiece there. You already have your shoulder pads and everything else on, so you're, you're already ready, but you have things in your possession that now you take up to go into the battle specifically. Make sense? Kind of give you a little kind of representation, visualization. I used to have a coach that, that always would say, hey, if I call you to go in the game and you do not have your helmet with you, then I'm calling somebody else. In other words, I don't have time to let you run up and down the sideline and find your helmet that you left over by the Gatorade cooler, all right, and then come back and get on the field. I'm not calling a timeout for you, in other words, okay? The clock is running. So we have to have things ready that when we're called on and when the enemy attacks, to engage. So there's this differentiation that we see in the verbs. So when the battle gets hot, there's some things we specifically need to take up that we already have in possession. And that's huge, okay? So these things aren't left over by the water cooler somewhere, right? These are already in our possession, and now we take them up to engage. Huge, huge application to this as we go through, all right? It's the things necessary to engage our enemy in battle, all right? So whatever this shield of faith is, guys, before we get into this, we can see that it's sufficient. And that's what I want us to get. This shield of faith, what did it say? Let's look at our, our, our verse again in verse 16. After it says, in addition to all this, which we, we just explained this transition of the verb, take up the shield of faith. Why? What is it going to do? Which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. How many of them arrows? Oh, not, not just some. Not, not just a few. All. Somebody say the word all. 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 Hey, y'all know what all means? All. All. <laughs> all is all means. And that's all all means. You know what I'm saying? It's all. It's every single one of them. Guys, how many of you today would like to know you have something in your possession that you can extinguish all the arrows of the enemy that's coming against you right now? 
Oh, somebody got to say amen. Are y'all awake out there? Man, I mean, all of them. I know somebody's under attack. I'm under attack. Are you under attack? I'm under attack. I want all the arrows extinguished. Guys, that is so huge. It just blows my mind. It's almost, I mean, and there's none of these pieces of armor that are more important than another. But my goodness, if you're going to take something that's going to extinguish all the arrows of the evil one, boy, that, that's huge. And then what is this piece of armor? We're going to talk about it. It's faith. How strong is your faith? So let's look at what we did the past couple weeks as we take these pieces of armor up. We're going to look at what is it? What is this shield that Paul is alluding to? We're going to look at why do we need it? And then we're going to look at how do we take it up? How do we apply it? What does it look like when it's applied in our life? So first, what is it? What is this shield that we're talking about? And probably most of you out there, when we start talking shield and you kind of get this visual kind of uh, representation in your mind, you're probably thinking of Captain America, right? And, and, and this shield. So you're thinking of this kind of kind of round shield. And I mean, that was a pretty cool shield. I mean, he could do some cool stuff with that, right? You know, he could throw that around, knock some cats down, and it would come back to him like a boomerang. I mean, that was pretty cool. But let's be honest, this shield was not excessively big. It wouldn't cover him completely. So with a barrage of attack of bullets or arrows or whatever, all right, and I know in Hollywood everything hit the shield, right? But even though it wasn't covering his whole body. But the arrows and the bullets were still going to hit him. You can hold the shield up over your head and chest, but you're going to hit everywhere else. Does that make sense? So the shield wasn't all sufficient. So Captain America, I don't know about y'all, but when, when I'm in a, the battle against an enemy, in my whole body, in my whole life, in my whole family, in this church, and everything's under attack. Captain America, you can keep your frisbee, dog. You know what I'm saying? I want something that's going to cover me. I want something that's going to cover me. And that's what this word is here we see. Because we know that if you look back at the type of shields that the Roman soldiers had, there was actually two types. There was the small round shield that they would have to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. All right. It would slip through the forearm and, and they so they could hold the sword in the other hand and engage one on one. So there was that type of shield. But that is not the shield that this word is talking about here. So if we look specifically at the word that's used in the word of God, it's the word thureos. And it refers to a completely different shield than the round one. This one is a full body shield. If you do your research and look at it, sometimes it's called a thoreon, and it's a shield that was about four and a half feet tall by about two and a half feet wide, all right? Oh, now we're talking, you know what I'm saying? That's like a door. <laughs> Give me that. That's what I want. I mean, that's good stuff. So you're standing behind this door, if you will, so now when you get down, you're covered. So we're looking at something about this height, and I'm down. I know y'all can see me. But anyway, but you're covered, right? I'm kind of like wider than this thing anyway. But so you have this two and a half foot by four and a half foot shield. Of course, uh, all the people back then were a little smaller, so they didn't have like linebackers out on the battlefield, I guess, because they'd be like, well, whatever. All right, but it covered you, okay? And so here's what we need to get is this is a huge shield in a door-like structure. And it was covered on the outside with metal and sometimes leather. And this leather could be soaked all right, with an oil or something, that get this, when the arrow would, that was on fire would hit, it would extinguish, it would put out the flame. And that's what the Bible's talking about. Isn't that cool? Anybody else love to learn this stuff and, and get the visual representation and then the application? Hey, man, we're going to learn more about this, but this, these shields were more than just a protection from the thump of the arrow, but they extinguished the fire that was meant to burn you up as well and everything around you and beside you. And that's what God wants our faith to do for us, to extinguish these arrows. So now that we know what it is, and now in the Roman soldier um, deal, because we know that this passage is a metaphor for us to, to use spiritually toward a spiritual attack. So now we know the likeness of what it was. So why do we need it? What's it for? Well, the Word of God already told us one of the main ways that was very obvious, and we just talked about it, was to extinguish the fiery arrows of enemy attack so you could quench so we could extinguish all of these i mean and, and that's that's where this sh uh, this shield of faith 
we're going to see is enough. That is, I mean, do you trust that, the, that faith in God is enough? And we're going to talk about what faith is because so many people have a misconception of what faith is. We don't know. And we're going to talk about that as well as we get into what it looks like. How do we take it up? All right? So this shield extinguishes the arrows. All right? And we've talked about what this looks like because we have to ask ourselves, what were these fiery darts? What are these arrows that are being launched at us? Well, if we look back in those Roman times, again, they wouldn't just shoot just a regular arrow. They would light it on fire. And how they would do it, they would dip it in, or they would have some kind of cloth or cotton or something around the end of the arrow. They would dip it, all right, in this kind of uh, almost like a, a tar type of a like substance, this uh, pitch that would be set on fire so it would stay on fire, okay? And here's what would happen. When the arrow would hit its target, this pitch, this tar-like substance or whatever it was, would spray off the arrow, would splatter, and it would catch on fire as well. So now you've got this splattering effect of fire that would spread it. So things would get burnt up. The person, the, the, the wooden fort, whatever it was meant to hit for its target. So that's what these arrows were and what their intent was to do. And that's why we would have this metal shield or leather that would extinguish these on the actual shield. So what are Satan's fiery darts then? I mean, if those were what the Romans were up against, so had they had the shield to extinguish these, what is the metaphorical representation spiritually for us? What are some of Satan's fiery darts that he shoots? What are they? Doubt. Discouragement. Depression. Anxiety. Loss of hope. Trust in man. Trust in government. <laughs> They'll take care of you. Yeah, right. How about sexual immorality, pornography, homosexuality, alcohol, drugs? Can we go down the list? What is he using to shoot at you to take you out? Is your shield big enough to block it, or do you have one of these? Because if you got one of these, it ain't no wonder you're getting stuck. Are you starting to see the totality of what's necessary to completely extinguish all the darts, all these fiery arrows of the evil one? Lust, what it comes down to, guys, is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that's what Satan is shooting at you, and he's shooting at me. And we have to have our faith big enough, strong enough, built on the foundation of Christ and the truth of his word to extinguish those arrows. And we'll get every single one of them if we make it big enough. Yeah, go ahead and give the Lord a big round of applause for that. Every single one of them. Not one of them will hit you. Not one of them can hit you. Not one. Not one. Adam and Eve got shot with a big one, didn't they? And it started this whole junk. And that that pitch spread like fire to all of mankind from sin. And every single person who was born after Adam and Eve, the Bible tells us, are now born into sin. That means we're on a direct path away from God until we make a conscious decision to repent and to turn away from our sin and to turn back toward Christ. That the Bible says we're going straight for a place called hell. And we can do that singing Amazing Grace and going to church every Sunday. Because it's not about where you are, it's a, and physically, it's about where you are internally in your heart. So where are you? Have you received Christ? Have you surrendered to him in totality so that you can have a chance at this faith to extinguish the dart? What was the dart that Satan threw at Adam and Eve to start this whole thing? In a gist, it's the same dart he's throwing at you with, with, whatever, with whatever specifically of all those things we just listed plus many more. At the heart of it is doubting God. Doubting what God's word says. You ever been there? Man, there's something in your life that you know, man. Maybe it's something you, you know you shouldn't, shouldn't be taking part in. You know it's worldly. You know deep down in your heart. And maybe you've even heard a, heard a pastor, a preacher, maybe even me, bring some truth to that aspect. Not my opinion. I don't want to give you my opinion 
my opinion does not matter on squat. Did you know that? That's why I don't give you my opinion. So I'm going to give you some advice. Nobody else's opinion matters either. Amen. Not the guy with all the big theological degrees and, and doctorate this and doctorate that and master this and master that. Baloney. Who cares? Great. You're smart. You took a test. <laughs> Where's your heart? Seriously. I could pass the test too. Come on. Opinion doesn't matter. What matters? Only truth does. Only truth matters. And you're going to find a lot of people whose opinion is to take this out of context and use it to justify your sin and make excuses for it. And I'm going to tell you, you can believe that if you want, but it's going to be a scary day one day when you meet the judge. <laughs> because just like the officer, when you're speeding, you say, well, sir, I didn't know the speed limit. My, my phone said it was 35, and I didn't know. It doesn't work because only truth matters. Not what you thought it was, not what professor so-and-so thought it was, not what your grandma thought it was, not what your mom or dad think it was, not even what you think it is. Only thing that matters is what God says it is. That's it. Do you know that type of truth? Do you know what God's word is? And then have you listened to the Holy Spirit when it's presented to you and said, Lord, help me change my heart and my life to walk in this manner worthy of my calling? Have you prayed that? That's what Ephesians says we have to do. That's so huge, guys. That's spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity doesn't make excuses for worldliness and sin. I'm going to tell you that right now. Never, never. Because the Spirit of God wants to move you away from that stuff. Completely. Man, so here's this, this extinguishing the arrows, this darts, because Adam and Eve fell by doubting God's word, by doubting his goodness, by doubting his truth. Satan fed him a lie. He shot him a lie. And that's what he's trying to shoot you and me. Lies. The question is, will we believe it? Will we buy it? Will we look for the teachers to tickle our ears and tell us what we want to hear? Or will we say, yes, God, this is your truth. I heard it. I'm not making excuses for it. I'm surrendering and submitting to it. Please help me because I'm in the flesh and I ain't perfect and my flesh is weak. How about you? I need help every day to follow God's word. But that's the heart that's the different. I'm not going to make excuses for my sin. I'm going to surrender and confess my sin and try to walk in a manner worthy of my calling. And that's what we all should do as believers, and that grows our faith, we're going to find out. So we know, number one, why do we need this shield? Obviously, extinguish the arrows. But here's two other things. If you look at how the Roman soldiers used these shields in battle, another way, so the second way we could use it is the way they used it, it was to push back against the enemy. That this shield, this big, large, huge door-like shield, now will give you the confidence to push back against the enemy that's attacking you. So once they got into close combat, if they got close enough, they would take this big old shield and thump the dude up in the head with it. That's cool. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you see the enemy coming, you just jack him right up in the head. I like that stuff. <laughs> man, this is good. We could preach on this a lot. Because, man, this is attacking an enemy that's coming to get you, and we're hitting him back. I like that. In other words, hey, I don't know about you, but there's, there's times, man, where I feel like I'm sitting in the corner. You ever watch Rocky? And I mean, the, and, and the dude's like backed him out in the corner, and he's just in the corner, and he's just getting thumped. Boom, boom, boom. Have you ever, you ever feel like that by Satan? Man, I do. I have recently. Where I'm just in the corner, and all I can do is just tuck, man, and just take punches and hits. But then at the time he stops, he messed up because he didn't take me out yet. Because there's something in me that I don't have, and it's called Christ. There's something in me that I don't have, and it's called the power of the Holy Spirit of God. There's a calling for something different, knowing my life is not my own, and that I have called to do something to build his kingdom and not mine. So I can take the thumps, I can take the bruises, and when it's time to come up through the power of Christ, that I'm going to attack. And you saw that point in Rocky where you thought he was going to lose, and then he comes back, and then he starts thumping at a brother, right? Until the battle's won. Guys, that's the spiritual victory we have. You're going to feel defeated. You're going to feel thumped in the corner sometimes. But don't quit. Don't give up. God is on your side. And his promises 
are true. You're sitting in it. You're sitting right in the middle of what we talk about right here. What Satan uses for evil, God's going to use for good. He's going to build it back stronger and better if we'll surrender and submit to his ways. Man, we're right in it. So we want to knock the enemy back. We want to thump him back on his heels. And it happens when we see this in Scripture where it says, submit yourselves to God, right? You know that verse. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So many people leave out the first part. All you ever hear is resist the devil and he will flee from you. That is not what you have to do. You have to do the first part first. You can try to resist the devil all you want in your own strength and you are going to lose. You're going to lose. You have to submit to God first, the Bible says. What is that? That's complete and total surrender to Jesus Christ and his authority and the truth of his word. I submit to that authority, and I put this big old shield now right there. Now I can resist the enemy, and he's going to flee. But that's only then. It's through the power of God that he provides. Nothing about my own strength. Nothing about my own willpower. Because you might do great against his attacks for a short period of time in your own strength because you may be a really strong-willed person you really might be you might be one of those people man that when you set off for a diet you diet you know what i'm saying you ain't like the rest of us that are getting ready to set new year's resolutions that will only last three days some of y'all man y'all do it you're strong-willed and you may fight the enemy like that for a season but there will be a point where you falter and fail and the enemy will take you out you have to first fight In the spiritual realm, going back to that, by submitting to God. Because that's where the victory is, not in the physical realm. It starts in the spiritual realm. Third thing we have to use this shield for, and we need it for, is to stand together and make an impenetrable wall. To stand together and make an impenetrable wall. So that with extinguished arrows, you can knock the enemy back, Or we could get together, picture 20 of us in a line here and 20 of us behind it, and we all got this big shield. The 20 in the first row get together and we put our shields side to side. So now you've got this four and a half foot by two and a half foot piece, and there's 20 of them all put together touching. They're kind of rectangular. And then you've got the row of 20 behind us, and they're going to set their shield at an angle almost like a roof. So the first group is, is down like this, holding the shield like a wall. The second group is kind of crouched down, standing, holding the shield like a roof over the head. So now they can shoot arrows, and it's not coming in or over. Because what these enemies were good at doing is they shot their bows, right? So they knew, hey, if you're just going to hold that shield straight up, I know I can't shoot straight into you. But what I can do is practice and see at what angle I have to put my bow up. Y'all with me? So that when I shoot, it goes up, and your shield, you're sitting there like this, and it comes down and stick you right in the head. Right? They were good at that stuff. They practiced, and they knew the angle of the archers to do that. So what they had to do is now have a shield forcing forward, but then also over top. And you could only do that in numbers. You couldn't do that by yourself. Can we please get that message, somebody, today? That that type of protection only comes in the body of Christ as a whole together. That type of strength, that type of wall against the enemy is built when you and I get together on Sundays at church and when we communicate and when we fellowship and when we get in life groups and when we do life together and when we serve and when we get connected and when we go and we charge the enemy together and we're putting up this shield of faith and we're strengthening each other and we don't even know it. And that is, and that is, man, I feel it so much in my heart through this, this whole pandemic season is there's been this spirit of, of, of the enemy of trying to isolate people, to get them by theirself, and to forsake the gathering with the excuse that online's great. I agree, online's great. Praise God for technology. Many are listening right now because of it. They wouldn't be able to listen, and that's beautiful. But please, when you are able, and if you are able, let's not forsake the gathering. There's strength in that. When we struggle with, with doubts, when we, when we need uh, other people, that is where we find it is in the body of Christ. You need that strength. You need that protection. You need that wall of faith all around you. Getting the picture of this shield, how important it is. Beautiful what the Word of God sh- shows us. 
So now, as we go through the five things of what it looks like and how to take it up. So how do we take up this shield that the Bible is talking about? We go through five things toward the end here. So the first, I feel like we need to know specifically what is this shield? Like spiritually, what is it? It's faith. What's faith? That's important. We can leave that here. Oh, yeah, that's cool, man. The Bible said to have a shield of faith, and I'm protected from all the, all the uh, arrows of the evil one. Man, I'm good to go. What's faith? Oh, faith just must be believing that Jesus is the Son of God and, and that God's Word's true. Good, I believe that. I'm good. I got faith. I'm ready to go. You're going to get shot up if that's all you think faith is shot up and that's what's happening in our churches today because that's all people believe faith is it's just believing by itself that is not the totality of faith that is the start of faith only the start but that does not build the shield matter of fact if all you do is believe you don't even have captain america's shield you got the cheap mcdonald's one you know what i'm saying that comes in the happy meal that's what you got you ain't doing nothing with that that's the start we need the whole shield. What is it? So what is faith? If you look in the, the Word of God, you go to Habakkuk, Romans, Galatians, Hebrews. It says the righteous will live by faith. What's faith? It's not just believing. It's not by itself. It's more than that. Faith in what? Faith in who? You ever thought about that? Faith in yourself? Faith in the government? Faith in your doctor? Or faith in a God who's in total control? What is faith? We see that faith is complete and total trust and application of Christ and his word. Complete and total trust and application of Christ and his word. That's complete surrender. The reos, the word for the shield when you think about this whole body covering, gives a beautiful picture of what God's true faith wants to do in you and me. It's God's inworking of faith in the life of a believer so that it completely covers you. It's beautiful. Does your faith completely cover you? Let it happen today. Let it start today. Because we see, if you look at, at faith, in this faith that we're talking about to move forward through trials, through circumstances, through resistance and everything that we're going to face from an enemy that's attacking and from a world that, that gives resistance, what do we need to have to, to live this out? Confidence. Courage. Go back to that courage word right from the beginning. And courage comes from confidence. You have to have confidence in something to be able to stand and come against opposition. If you don't have confidence in it, you're not going to be ready to engage the enemy. So what's confidence? If you look at the root words of the word confidence, there's two root words in it. It's cone and fideo. Cone means with. Fideo means faith. Oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? So what is confidence? It's living with faith. Do you have that? Do you live with faith and a confidence in God and the truth of his word that it will extinguish all the arrows of the enemy? Man, I got this joke on confidence. And those of y'all that have been in Impact a while, this will probably be the second or third time you've heard it, so I apologize, all right? But, it, but, it, but it's pretty cool, so y'all entertain me. Next time, if the Lord brings this up again, I promise I'll find another joke, all right? I don't tell too many jokes, so that's why I don't have too many in my pocket. But I got this one. Y'all ready? So for confidence, there, there was this, middle-aged woman, all right, and she, and she went on a vacation. She went on a cruise ship by herself, and she was on this cruise ship, and she saw this strikingly handsome captain, all right, and so she started watching this captain. Like, she couldn't take her eyes off this hunk of a man, right, and she just was just loving every minute of watching him. Well, before long, as the days went on through the week, the captain started noticing her watching him, and it's like, man, that's kind of weird, right? You ever get that feeling of somebody watching you, like, and, and every time you look at them, they're looking at you, and they look real quick, one of them. So the captain noticed her watching him constantly, day in, day out. 
And finally, he's like, man, you know what? I, I just got to go talk to this lady. So he goes up and he has, he says, ma'am, says, uh, I, I noticed you've been staring at me, watching me all week. So I, I just want to know, so do, do, do I know you? And she says, no, well, you don't know me. She said, but it's amazing how much you look like my third husband. <laughs> and he's like, whoa. He's like, really? Um, well, how many times have you been married? She said, twice. <laughs> Some of y'all get that on the way home. That's confidence, right? That's confidence. Hey, God wants us to have that kind of confidence spiritually with the things in the battle ahead for us. Do we know that we know that the victory is ahead and what God wants to do in our life? So y'all are probably glad I told that joke again. Some of y'all ain't heard that. So the, the five things we know now that we're trying to get this definition of faith is the first thing that we need to do and how we take this up is that we know faith is a complete obedience to Christ. That is, that is it. Faith is not just believing. It is complete obedience to Christ and his word. That is a lost taught art in the churches of America today. You say the word obedience and people run out of the church. People claim legalism. Oh, that's a legalistic pastor over there. <laughs> what? Did you read this or did you listen to the prop? Obedience is part of the Great Commission to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Obedience. It's proof of a heart changed for God. It's proof. Faith is obedience to Christ. It's not just believing. Look at James. Can we read that real quick? Turn with me to James chapter 2. And let's look at verses 18 to 26. James chapter 2, verses 18 to 26. The Word of God says this. It says, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. <clears throat> Come on, James. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Oh, it ain't just about believing, y'all. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous, get this, by what they do and not by faith alone. It's not just about believing. It's about a heart that's been sanctified, purified, cleansed, and desires to go in the direction of Christ. It doesn't mean we're not going to mess up. We're going to mess up all along the way, but our heart's desire is to be different. It's to be set apart. Verse 25. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Oh my goodness. And how many people that claim to be a follower of Christ have faith with no fruit dropping under the tree of deeds? Matter of fact, the fruit dropping under the tree is the opposite of the fruits of faith. What fruit's under your tree? You don't do good works to get saved. You do good works because you're saved. Because of the Spirit of God in you, it now has given you a different heart for a different direction, a new desire, a new song, a new heart. And the Bible says that this leads to joy in our life and happiness. Man, how many people are looking for, for joy right now, right? Something to be happy about, to take part in, and to have the fullness of joy. Not happiness like an emotion that fleets up and down with your circumstances. Joy, a, a condition of the heart that happens irregardless of your circumstances. That's what the Bible says happened when, what? When you obey the word of God. Did you know that? True joy comes with obedience to God's word. Proverbs 8, 34 says, Happy is the man who hears my word and keeps it. Woo! Man, think about Jeremiah. You look in Jeremiah chapter 15, 
And he was living in a society where, where, where nobody listened to God, absolute nobody. Sound familiar? Getting that way. And yet he said in verse 16 of chapter 15, your words were found and I did eat them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Oh, that's good stuff. I did eat them. Everybody, anybody come hungry for the word of God each week? Yeah. I mean, because we give it, hey, y'all, some of y'all be like the first time, I mean, is this dude preaching this long? Really? My pastor only preaches 20 minutes. That's a devotion. Come on, man. I ain't come here for a snack. I want a steak. Yeah, baby. Hey, so Jeremy, somebody, somebody's like, yeah, but I'm hungry. <laughs> so the word of God says, man, that here it is. That Jeremiah said, I found your word and I ate it. Hey, and I, I think of, of God's word with Jesus himself. So, man, I'm the bread of life. Those who come to me, you're not going to hunger anymore. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Do you hunger for the word of God? Do you feast on his word? Because what we're going to see is it grows your faith. It gives you joy through that obedience to God's word. It builds your faith. It builds, builds the shield that covers you. Man, even Psalm 119 talks about how wonderful it is to obey the word of God. Revelations 1, 3, happy is the man who reads this and keeps it. 1 John uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 says, I write these things to you that you and your joy may be full. Anybody hearing God's word yet? Guys, faith is not inherited. Faith is developed. It's developed through a walk day in, day out with God and submitting to his word. Every time the Lord shows you something through his word and through his truth, surrender. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, that's going to hurt, Lord, but yes, Lord. <laughs> My gum just came out. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Say, I got to do that. So, man, talk about eating stuff, man. So we know that faith comes through hearing. Faith is developed and hearing through the word of God. Faith grows with our obedience. There's your main point in that. What does it look like to take it up? Surrender and complete obedience. Second point, faith stands when others fall. Faith stands when others fall. Guys, faith is being rooted in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Do you know that? Are you shaken by the circumstances in the world around you? Or are you so rooted in God's word and are you so eternally focused that it doesn't matter what goes on around you, you're unshaken? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 through 29 gives us that word. Verses 25 through 29 says, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, thinking about like Noah, people who warned them, the flood was coming, but they didn't listen. So if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Oh, that's beautiful. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Only I can't say it any better than that. Are you part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken? Strengthen your faith. Strengthen your walk. Because you will be able to then stand when others around you fall and are shaken. The shield of faith gives you confidence to stand in the face of your enemy because you know you're protected. And you feel it. That's what God wants to give you. Faith is the product, guys, of great battles and trials overcome in your journey of life. Did you know that? that the strength of your faith is going to be a product of how you endure, of how you persevere through trials, and it strengthens your faith. And, and you see God work, and you see God do things like this when things were torn apart, and you wondered what was going to happen, and it strengthens your faith. It strengthens your faith when a year-and-a-half-old church sets out to purchase 42 acres of land, and they only have $80,000 in the bank account. That doesn't make sense in human mind. But then when you see God step in, and when he cast the vision, and when he said, this is it, and you go after it, and you watch God work, and now we own 42 acres of land. I mean, when, when, when you see God do stuff like that, it strengthens your faith. 
It's trials. It's, it's, it's persevering and watching God do his work. Guys, number three, faith relentlessly moves forward. Faith relentlessly moves forward. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, is what the Word of God says. Did you know that? And faith re relentlessly moves forward because it is the victory, the Bible says, that overcomes the world. Is your faith victorious? Do you know that it is? This faith will help you overcome to move forward. Because what faith is, basically... And this is, this is where so many people get tripped up. It's like, well, I just wish God would show me which direction I want to go and, and, or which direction I need to go. And I wish we would show me, you know, what it's going to look like five, ten years from now. Hey, can I tell you right now that that's not how God works? That God is going to show you step number one. And that's what you have to take the step in obedience to first. Because I'm going to be honest with you. If he showed you step 20, you would run for the hills. Right? I mean, thinking of step one, and I ran from it when God was calling me to preach and plant a church. I ran from that for two years. That's my wife. It's like, God, you got the wrong person. I ain't going to stand up there and preach. Go get somebody else. I'm not doing that. And that was hard enough to take step one. If he would have showed me step 10 with all the tents blowing down and, and all the chaos and everything, I'd be like, no, sir. Thank you very much. I'm going to Tarshish, not Nineveh. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Go ahead and send the whale. Hey, but God wants us to step out in faith because the faith that God requires will move you forward. Faith is starting out without knowing how it's going to turn out and knowing every step of the way that it's going to be okay. Do you have a faith like that? Have faith in God, church. Look at the person beside you. Tell them, have faith in God. Say it with me. Have faith in God. Hey, let's say it all together. Have faith in God. Number four, faith moves mountains. Faith moves mountains. Matthew 17, 20 says, those who have faith as small as a mustard seed has the ability to move mountains. That blows my mind. You see, because here's the truth. Faith doesn't demand miracles. It produces miracles. Oh, that's beautiful. And I didn't, I didn't get that. Some other pastor wrote that and I found it. That's good stuff. Faith does not demand miracles. It produces miracles. Man, that's beautiful. And it's the, all through the Bible, you see about this, this call to move from a little faith to a great faith. So if a little faith can move a mountain, what could a great faith do? And that's what God has called you to is a great faith. That's what God has called you to, mom, dad, is a great faith. To raise your sons and daughters up in the admonition of the Lord. That's what God has called you to, young man, young woman. He's called you to a great faith. Not to follow the world, because broad is the road that leads to destruction. But narrow is the, is the way that leads to eternal life. You better get on that road, because I'm going to tell you, I don't know how much time's left on the clock, but I can tell you we're in the fourth quarter. You ain't got time to be on the broad path. You ain't got time to say, oh, I'll get my life right someday, one way. Hey, can I tell you? Man, getting your life right isn't about one day when you get married and you just settle down and you start acting a, stop acting a fool. Because a lot of people do that without Christ. Amen? Don't do the things they used to do just because they get married and settle down. That has nothing to do with God in their life. Why don't you let God do what he wants to do in your life through the presentation of his word and you surrender? That's faith. That's walking with Christ. And this faith says it will move mountains move mountains and you think about the stress and strain that's involved and how you get stronger hey god wants to strengthen your faith muscle today just like in the weight room how the stress and strain of repetition of heavy weights tears the muscle fibers down and as they recover they build up bigger and stronger so you, that you can push more weight the next time that's what god wants to do with your spiritual walk ladies and gentlemen can we hear that stop trying to get out from under the resistance and push through it with Christ at the center and through his strength because he's doing something that you won't imagine. Number five, our final point, faith becomes our strong tower. When we take this up, this is what it looks like. Faith becomes our strong tower. Proverbs 18 verse 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous runs to it, into it and are safe. Do you run into the strong tower, the refuge of Christ himself? 
God told Abraham, he said, I am your shield. You know what, you want to know what this shield of faith is? It's not about you. It's about God. God is your shield. Put your faith in him. Put your family's hands in him. Put your life in his hands. Psalms 84 says the Lord God is a shield. He's on your side, guys. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless you, not with the American dream. And that's where people get so messed up. They think that blessings come financially and this, that, and the other. His blessings come spiritually through a calling on your life where Christ is shown out to others and people come to know Jesus because of your walk. That's blessing. Get it off the tangibles. Just erase blessing with tangible things off your radar. Because then you'll be happy. I promise you. Because then you won't just look for more and more and more in the world. You'll look for more and more and more in Christ. And you look for what God's doing. Do you have that faith? Do you keep his word and obey it? Have you made a resolve in your heart to not push back against the preaching of the word? And when God's truth is revealed and you say yes to Jesus... Guys, there's no reason to lose this battle. There's no reason to lose this battle. God has provided the armor you need for victory, and the shield of faith will protect you. So take up the whole armor of God. Take up this shield, because faith is not just knowing God can do it, but it's knowing God will do it, because it's all by him, through him, and for him, and it's for his glory. God's not moved by our emotions. God's not moved by our, our tears, our crying. God's not moved by our anger. He's moved by our faith. Do you have a faith strong enough that allows God to move in your life? Will you take that with you today? Take up the shield, build it, and let's go out and let's extinguish all the arrows of the enemy. Bow your head, close your eyes. If you're honest today, and the Lord spoke to you and just say, God, I want a faith like you desire me to have. And here's the beautiful thing. You may not be where you want to be, but you may not be where you used to be. And in Christ, if you truly surrender to Christ, he's going to meet you where you're at right now, wherever that is, failing, su successful in your walk. He's going to meet you right where you're at. But here's what he's going to do. He's going to meet you where you're at, but he is not going to leave you where you're at. If you surrender to him and his word, you we will, will be moving forward in your walk. Will you do that today? Will you surrender to that calling? Maybe there's somebody here today and you say, Brad, I want this faith that you're talking about. Because I always thought faith was just believing. I didn't know it had to do with so much more that it had to do with surrender. Because I haven't surrendered. I've believed, but I haven't surrendered. If that's you today, I want you to surrender. I'm going to lead you through a prayer, for, and I just want you to mean business with, and, and pray out from your heart to God's heart and just say, God, today I surrender. I want to do more than just believe. Just like the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, Lord, what must I do to be saved? He knew Jesus was God. He knew he was the Messiah. He came to the right place. He believed. And Jesus even said, oh, he listed out a few of the Ten Commandments, and Jesus knew that's what was about to be saved, but he knew this guy's heart. And the guy said, man, I've done all those Ten Commandments. I'm good. Am I good? And Jesus said, nope. What you got to do is give all your money to the poor and come follow me. And the Bible says the man went away dejected. What is that about? Did God want his money? Nope. What did God want? He wanted his heart. And he knew that this man's heart was set somewhere apart from him, even though he believed, can we get that message? Even though he knew Jesus was God, even though he knew he was salvation, he could not surrender. 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 Somebody today needs to surrender. You believe, that's great, even demons believe. Have you surrendered? Surrender to him and his word today, right now. 
Get right with God. Examine yourselves to see if you're of the faith. If that's you today and you're ready to surrender, pray this prayer from your heart to God's heart. Or if you're here today, you say, Brad, I've surrendered earlier in my life, but lately, man, I've I've tripped up, messed up, walked away. I've let that belt of truth slip off my waist. I've, that breastplate of righteousness has been sitting on the shelf. And, and man, I'm all jacked up in my life right now. And I want to come back to Jesus today. I want to rededicate my life. If that's you, I want you to rededicate your life. Pray this same prayer. Get back to a walk of surrender right now. Whether that's for the first time or rededication, pray to God right now to say, Dear God, I come to you right now in total surrender. I'm waving the white flag. It's not about my will anymore, God. I'm coming to you in the truth of your word. Lord, today I want to know for sure that I have you in my life. So I'm coming and I'm admitting to you that I'm a sinner and I have fallen short of your glory and I'm in need of a savior. So, Lord, today I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross that I could have forgiveness of my sin. I thank you for your promise, Lord, of redemption and restoration and forgiveness of sin when we confess our sin to you. And, Lord, today I'm asking for a new heart. Thank you for raising him from the grave, proving that he was God in victory over hell, death, and the grave. And Lord, I want that same victory right now in my life. Lord, I need it so desperately. So Lord, I surrender to you. 